There are nine days until Britain goes to the polls, and since landing last night, Donald Trump is in the UK. This was always going to be a tricky moment for Boris Johnson, but as it stands, Trump is keeping to the script. He hasn't said anything about backing a side in this election, and he's even said he wouldn't want Britain's National Health Service if it was handed to him on a platter. Should we believe America's president, who just happens to be a pathological liar? And what will the British public make of the Donald's visit? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by the inimitable Ash Sarkar. Ooh. Pleasure to have you here this evening. I don't evening. know why that was my inimitable no, noise. I was like, ooh. Uh, I'm also joined by angry medical student Julia Simons. Hey, promise to be slightly less angry. Slightly less she angry. She actually threw a chair across the room at me <laughs> just before we went live. <laughs> <laughs> it's frightening. Angry at nine years of Tory cuts. <laughs> uh, you might recognise Julia because she went viral right at the start of this general election. In fact, in a video that we showed, we showed, or sh- we showed on, I, I just <laughs> I forgot what the past tense of show was. <laughs> I was thinking, is, like it, I was thinking is it shoe <laughs> that, we, that we showed on Tisky Sour at the start of the general election? This is why I need a script in case I can't remember the past tense of verbs. Uh, we're going to show a short clip of Julia at the start of this campaign when Boris Johnson visited her hospital in Cambridgeshire. So let's watch that now. I just came out of clinic um, and I was told that Boris Johnson was coming and I was like, oh my goodness, that, like, as a normal person, you never get that opportunity to say something to someone like that. I really want to ask him like, what's next? Um, and I was told I wasn't allowed to ask him any questions, which I think is a really good sign. This is a PR stunt. People who work in this hospital know the reality of cuts. Like, I'm a medical student. I don't know the reality of cuts in the way these people do. They were all really angry to hear that he's coming here for a PR stunt because we know what cuts have done to our NHS. We know that NHS is being privatised, even if it's not explained in explicit terms. I mean, Jeremy Hunt literally wrote a book about how to privatise the NHS. And he was scared to be asked questions by members of the general public because he knows that what he's done is indefensible when you look at the reality of waiting times, when you look at the reality of people not getting that treatment when they need it. Not because of poor medical care, but because of cuts that prevent it. So that clip was shared thousands and thousands of times. I think, I think about a million times on Twitter. Uh, maybe similar on, no, or seen a million times on Twitter, probably similar on, on Facebook. And I think that was in a fairly disastrous trip trip for Boris Johnson, right? So he visited the hospital, he got booed out. Then you were interviewed outside about the whole the whole incident and how no staff had been informed. Tell us about that day. Has it changed well, your firstly, life? Well, firstly, you know, I've got to say thank you. It's probably the only thing I can say thank you to Boris Johnson for, yeah. which is giving me a platform to reveal his disastrous PR stuff. So <laughs> cheers for not answering my questions. That's great. Um, yeah, so it was really bizarre. So quite a senior member of staff walked into clinic and she was huffing and puffing. And obviously I can't name anyone. Um, and in a very kind of flustered manner, I can't believe Boris Johnson's here. I'd go biff him myself if I could. Um, to which I thought, oh, great. I like Boris your senior Johnson's member here. of staff sounds a little bit like Boris Johnson. She but. does a little bit. <laughs> She's a secret Tory. Um, and so, you know, I went and I probably made a little bit of a mistake by proudly announcing that I hate him with my whole soul mm. um, quite loudly to another member of staff who shared my sentiments. Um, but that then let me follow him as he led an orchestrated procession out of the hospital. And thankfully, you know, not being a hospital regular, he wasn't aware there were actually two doors to leave. So he got all of his security people to block one door, not realising that they'd left the main door completely unblocked. So I followed him out that way. Mm. Um, And you did get a chance to ask him a question. So I did try and ask him questions. And weirdly, everyone picked up on the fact that I was talking about the NHS. But the last question I asked him as he walked into his taxi chauffeur, whatever, was have you read the IPCC report? Because more uh, than anything... Because you're an, you're an activist for Extinction Rebellion medics, right? Yeah. That's a faction. I suppose it's not faction because you don't fight the other factions. It's not like the medics <laughs> versus the Extinction affinity Rebellion group. firefighters. But yeah, the affinity group, I suppose, is, is more what it's called. So what did, you, what did you ask him about climate change? So as a doctor of the future, I don't really see the point in learning all of this medicine if we're not going to be living in the same kind of society that we have today and his government's track record and his own articles denying the existence of climate change betray that they have no interest in addressing this issue. So my main question was really like, have you read it? Do you understand the science? And the reality is like we're living in kind of a post-truth era and if they do understand the science, they're willingly committing us to quite a disastrous future unless they change their act pretty quickly. 
And do you think Boris Johnson has... Because I mean, I, I remember at the start of this campaign, it seemed like Boris Johnson was going to try and be a man of the people. He, he kept walking around you know, English towns and he was in lots of hospitals. Um, but it seems to me that because so many people like yourself have harangued him in those moments, there was also very famously uh, the man in, in Whips Cross in East London whose son or daughter, I'm not sure, daughter. Young, young, young child had been waiting for a long time to see a doctor who, who harangued him there. Do you think he's given up speaking to ordinary people now and just focused on targeted Facebook ads? Well, I mean, they have plenty of money for the targeted Facebook ads and it probably allows them to get less abuse from real people. Um, I can't see how anyone who doesn't believe leave means leave could in any way approach him in a hospital in a positive manner. You have to be completely deluded about the way they've treated the NHS over the last nine years as a healthcare professional to stand and support someone who has pretty much ignored any request from any medical professional body about how to improve the NHS. Let's talk about the day's events, uh, which was obviously involving the visit of Donald Trump. Uh, there was a NATO meeting, that's what he was here for, but obviously everyone was you know, interviewing him, wondering if he would intervene in the general election. I think Boris Johnson wasn't too keen for his endorsement. He didn't think that would look particularly good. And he hasn't, to be fair to him, endorsed Boris Johnson over here. But he is following, I think, Boris Johnson's script. And that is to say that despite any previous assertion that the NHS would be on the table, the Americans have no interest uh, in, in our National Health Service, however profitable it would be uh, to their pharmaceutical companies, etc., and however much it may figure in the ambitions they have in future negotiations. He doesn't want it. He's not interested. He, he just doesn't care. We're going to watch a clip of him today uh, brush off a question about whether or not the Americans would be interested in getting their hands on our NHS in any future trade agreement. Should the National Health Service be on the table in trade talks? No, not at all. I have nothing to do with it. Never even thought about it. Uh, honestly, we have enough... Uh, look... We are going to have a great health care system. We're doing great health care work. We've got things really running well. And if we, get, if we get elected, if we take the House, keep the Senate, keep the White House, we'll have phenomenal health care. But right now, we've made it very good. And we have 180 million people on plans that they absolutely love, private plans that they absolutely love. But in this country, no, they have to work that out for themselves. We have absolutely, I don't even know where that room is started. We have absolutely nothing to do with it. And we wouldn't want to. If you handed it to us on a silver platter, we want nothing to do. So you said that Donald Trump had asserted today that in spite of previous comments, he had no interest in the NHS being on the table in a trade negotiation. That was actually a bit of fake news, Michael. Oh, shit. Because Donald Trump, in fact, plainly states that he has never even thought about the NHS being on the table for a trade negotiation, and he wouldn't want it even if it came on a silver platter. Now, there are two reasons why he might have completely obliterated his earlier comments this year of the NHS and everything else being on the table. One is he's an older fella, memory not so good anymore. Or the second is that he's lying to preserve Boris Johnson's chance of becoming prime minister and staying in number 10. And the reason why I think we're more likely to be looking at that second option than the first one is because we have this little thing called documentary evidence showing that the Americans are very interested in the NHS being on the table in a trade negotiation. So last week with the explosive revelation of the unredacted trade documents of Jeremy Corbyn wielding the receipts like Kim Kardashian, um, <laughs> is that they showed that the baseline for trade talks is total market access for US corporations to British public services. It showed that across six meetings between senior UK officials and the US that the pricing of drugs had been discussed and significant progress had been made in that area. And even just today, Dominic Raab on Sky News, that vein in his forehead <laughs> pulsating like Bergine just before closing time, uh, said that if the Americans choose to spike the price of drugs 
following our exit from the European Union, well, that's just their decision mm. to take. So all the evidence that we have about what the real intentions of Trump are towards the NHS shows that it is within his interest, it's within American economic interests to have access to the British healthcare market. So then you've got to think, has he simply forgotten that or is he lying for a purpose and for long-term gain? You decide. Uh, no, I decided. He's lying. Okay, okay, I decided. Good. You, you framed it as you framed it as an option that people people could. Yeah, that, that could was just to make people feel comfortable. But I decided. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think many people in, in the country are gonna are gonna believe that. Um, I wondered if we could go into a bit more detail about what was in in those documents when 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 Corbyn was brandishing the receipts last week, which I think were about the objectives of the Americans, not so much about what the British had had accepted. So what? What the Tories are doing is every time they go on the TV, they're saying, this is absolute nonsense, it's lies. Well, actually, to be honest, at the moment, they just say, actually, it's from Russia, which is completely irrelevant because <laughs> no one is disputing that the documents are genuine. Also, also, the Telegraph led with a splash today saying these documents are from Russia and they have very little evidence for this. They've got the report of someone who was part of the Integrative Initiative, which we know is part of this anti-Corbyn disinformation campaign. But the irony of ironies is that the Telegraph themselves broke a story earlier this year based on those same documents mm. back in June. So are the Telegraph now feeling the meddling hand of Putin dictating their editorial copy? Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's not... I mean, to be honest, I thought it was a bit of a strategic mistake on the part of the Tories because all that did was push up the news agenda, these documents again. So, I mean, Laura Pidcock was on, on Sky News this morning. I think she was going on there to talk about workers' rights, but she was asked over and over again by Kay Burley about the Russian origins or provenance of these documents. And she was like, well, look, to be honest, I don't, I don't care where they're from. I don't know where they're from. But the issue is what was in them is not disputed by the British government. So let's talk about the contents. And the contents are that there have been discussions about the NHS in US trade negotiations and that the Americans very much have at the top of their priorities uh, access to NHS markets. So to me, the whole Russian thing was a mistake by a mistake by the Tories, just as it was a mistake by, I suppose, Hillary Clinton. Ne never focus on Russia. It's always a losing game when it comes to politics. I mean, and, and no one is denying the veracity of these documents. The only question you have to ask is to Liam Fox, can you confirm or deny that you were at these meetings? To the relevant government ministers, are these legitimate or not? Because if they are legitimate, I don't care. Where are they from? Where they're from. I don't care if Rudolf Nureyev himself handed them over. Famous ballet dancer. Yeah, I was like, mm, I didn't know who that was. Was he, did, was he a spy? Uh, he wasn't a spy, but he was a very famous ballet dancer. I actually think he's now deceased. And he was in my favorite episode of The Muppets. He, was, he danced in the Swine Lake with Miss Piggy. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, what a man. I almost hope that it's kind of some self-sabotage from the times where they're like, we've been printing such utter rubbish. Let's print something that's so ridiculous about these documents coming from Russia and Corbyn being in bed with the Russians to alert people to the fact that Boris Johnson is still sitting on the Russia report that, yeah. P.S., we ourselves won't report about. It just seems absurd that they choose this headline and this tact. Like, I don't the think Russia is going to help the Conservatives in this election. I think it's probably not going to help the Labour Party anyway. But let's talk about, is Boris Johnson going to sell the NHS to Donald Trump? I mean, it's, it's slightly confusing. Should we take that literally? What's going on? Fill us in. So they're never going to put a for sale sign on the NHS. It's not going to win them votes. And I think that this narrative has been quickly pulled apart by the right wing media for saying, you know, it doesn't state in those documents the NHS is for US sale. Well, obviously it doesn't. What it does say is that climate change is definitely off the table. So if in those documents the US are able to say climate change is off the table, why hasn't our government said the NHS is off the table? They haven't because it's not off the table. And the idea that Dominic Raab and so and so, and so, like, so forth talk about drug prices and try and, you know, oh, it, it will be their choice if they increase them. Well, no, actually, in US legislation, it states they have to aim for full market access. Mm. Full market access for our drug prices means more expensive drugs for the NHS, crippling a system that's already underfunded. They could have chosen to take pharmaceutical negotiations 
away from that discussion. They could have kept pre-existing trade agreements on pharmaceuticals. They chose not to. And that particularly places us in a very vulnerable position for the National Health Service, considering that currently 73% of our drugs come from the EU. So when we're looking at No Deal 2.0 this time next year, we're not going to have a choice. We're not going to be the strong party in that negotiation. Mm. And we will fall victims to what is obviously a flawed system in the US because they pay so much more for their drugs because of this deregulated free market that PS does not drive innovation. That is literally just a myth. I mean, I sometimes feel that I am being gaslit by political <laughs> commentators. So not just, you know, out and out, full-time cranks like Dan Hodges, but also well-regarded journalists like Jim Pickard have been saying, oh, the left keep going on about privatization of the NHS. But if that was really going to happen, it would have happened already. And Game, it has. set and match. Exactly. We've seen 15 billion pounds worth of private contracts uh, go out in the last four years. You have profitable bits of the NHS, for instance, responsibility over blood plasma, sold off to private equity firms, and they were then sold off again to a Chinese company. You've had the, rather than a full-on assault at the principle of the NHS being free at the point of use, although over time that has been eroded too, particularly with prescription charges, which uh, were the first to go shortly after the NHS was founded, you have the profitable bits of the NHS is functioning, carved up and sold off. And that's something which happened under new labor, in particular with those PFI contracts, which turned out to be a huge disaster with the collapse of Carillion, and subsequently under both the coalition government and the conservatives. So what I find deeply dispiriting is that commentators who literally get paid to know about UK politics and social history are sitting there like, well, you don't have to pay to see the GP. Oh, go. It's not been privatised. Because it seems to me that they don't know what privatisation means themselves. I mean, actually, you know what? I'm go I just remembered it, so I'm going to say it now. You're watching Tiski Sal, you're watching Navarro Media. As you know, this organisation, this show... This channel is only possible because of your kind support. If you are already a subscriber, thank you very much. You are what makes this possible. If not, please go to support.navarromedia.com and give us the equivalent of one hour's wage a month and potentially give us an election bonus. Announcement from today. We will be going nightly on weeknights, at least, until the general election. Ooh, and whoa. on the evening of the general election, we will have once again election sesh, uh, which will be, I suppose, about six hours of unadulted live TV from in this studio where we, where we pick through the exit polls and the results as they come in, talk about what is coming next. I suppose look back on the campaign when there are quiet moments in terms of results moments coming in. Moments of quiet reflection. Exactly. The beautiful thing about Navarra Media is that we are free at the point of use. We're kind of like <laughs> the church. We're free at the point of use, but we do accept tithes. But soon we will be like the NHS in the sense that anyone earning a decent income will have to pay us a proportion of it so that we can keep going out is that one of john mcdonald's secret plans that he's yes. gonna just launch three days before he told me day. he told me personally when he came on to do an interview he said michael there's there's only one condition i will hold you to for us to give you i suppose a, a license to run forever based on mm -hmm. on direct taxation a royal charter and it was that you start running on time <laughs> and 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 today we we went live at eight minutes past eight which to be fair is an improvement. So I think that's going to go down pretty well. I feel well got like a Virgin Trains definition of punctuality. <laughs> <laughs> Getting better. Um, although I noticed that many people in the comments were very surprised we went live about eight past eight. And I'm worried that we've sort of done a, a boy who cried wolf thing so that now you don't believe we're going to go live until 15 minutes afterwards. So you tune in late. But in any case, um, from now until the general election, <laughs> although I say from now until the general election, we'll start on time. But tomorrow, Aaron Bastani is hosting. Much as I love him, doesn't always turn up on time, but neither do I. We're just as bad as each other. I feel bad now. You mean I feel Aaron bad now. Bass Tardy? Oh, I like that. Um, anyway, tune in tomorrow at 8. It will be excellent. Um, we are going to talk about past statements uh, from the current Tory cabinet and the current Tory prime minister. You said it is somewhat uncritical, somewhat unreasonable uh, for British commentators or journalists to scoff 
that the NHS has still not been privatized. So why are these lefties uh, still going on about it? Even though we know, yeah, that privatization has doubled since 2010. They're already doing it. Because they went through the NHS documents, basically find in page NHS Control for sale, F, yeah. didn't find it. And they were like, well, there you go. Case closed. And I think also in terms of like what this government has already done in terms of privatization, the media has a responsibility to hold them to account for that. And they just haven't. So in 2012, there was legislation placed that basically says any contract above £600,000 has to go out for tender to private companies. And that happens. And that's basically led to private companies take cherry picking the parts of the NHS where they can make, you know, squeezes to patient care and generate profits. And I think that generation of profit is completely un like covered by the general media because they don't talk about the fact that when companies are making profit out of providing services for the NHS, they're making profit out of you, the taxpayer. And they're also not mm. making profit by providing better care because the British Medical Association has looked at these independent service providers and examined whether or not the care is better. And it's it's not. There's no evidence. There wasn't even any evidence to bring in this principle of marketization. And actually, it's completely ideological to have done it because it has got worse and they don't even talk about it. It's absurd. Let's talk about the ideology of these bastards <laughs> yes, who are currently Michael. in the government and who are running for re-election. We're going to look at bastard number one. Michael Walker who just said, Dominic, fuck it, mask off. Who is Dominic Raab. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get into sort of four-letter words. Uh, it's election time. I don't want to say anything that can be construed as, as too offensive. Let's look at Dominic Raab. <laughs> it wouldn't be libelous. Pulse, Truth is an absolute defense. was pulsating vein on Radio 4 this morning as he has read his past statements on what he wants to do to our beloved health service. Can we get that clip up now? Roll it, Fox. That's a ludicrous Fox. assertion. And the, the reality well, is... it is, true or not? No, you wrote that true. pamphlet. Well, I, you can, you've picked probably a snippet from a pamphlet written a long time ago, but I can tell you categorically, I've never advocated privatisation of the NHS. Well, it also said the NHS but, should take advantage of the extra efficiencies private companies can provide. It was called after the coalition and you were one of the authors. Yes, I co-authored with, uh, I think there were five of us in total. Look, when you go into the, your average hospital, you see a Costa Coffee there, you see a florist there. Is anyone seriously suggesting that the nurses, the doctors, the civil servants in the Department of Health should be running those services? That's wholesale different from talking about um, clinical services. We're absolutely clear. The NHS is not going to be privatised. The big uh, expansion of private companies in the NHS took place under the last Labour government when the current Shadow Health Secretary, John Ashworth, was advising on well, PFI projects. Sorry to remind so you of it, the pamphlet hypocrisy. talked about hospitals being run by private companies. It didn't talk about coffee shops and florists. It said hospitals, the, the, and your name was on it. Well, it certainly wasn't anything I wrote, and it's certainly not... I just want to say that Dominic Raab, when forced to give an account of himself to Nick Robinson had the demeanor of a man who's telling you that it's your fault that he cheated. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's that way of like talking like, I know you've caught me out, but actually if you look at this carefully, it was your fault because you're working late and I'm but a man and I have urges. Like it really had that. <laughs> I feel a bit triggered. I mean, I feel a bit like this is bringing back some really bad memories. I mean, the thing that Nick Robinson is referring to there as Dominic Robs vein is about to explode because he's reading him back quotes that he wrote in his own pamphlet in 2012 how dare he maybe we should uh, send him to his gp for that, for that <laughs> yeah. vein he probably won't get an appointment anytime soon <laughs> yeah no he can't wait three weeks like, <laughs> it was a it was a pamphlet called after the coalition published in 2012 with other leading figures now in the government such as pretty patel liz trust quasi Kwarteng, and chris skidmore um who i got distracted by his name um <laughs> <laughs> they said oh, are you they, six? they were so, I am about six <laughs> they said uh, uh, that two thirds of hospitals could be run by private firms or by non-profit organisations so basically they're talking about the denationalisation of, of, of the NHS in that interview Dominic Raab is trying to say well I mean we were only talking about Costa Coffees and Nick Robinson fair play to him we, you know, we don't always think that the, the BBC are as tough on the Tories as they have to be. Fair play to him. He said that, no, you were, talk you were talking about hospitals. You weren't talking about Costa Coffee. It's written down. It's in print. Um, and yet still, he tries to deny it. I mean, you can look at the privatisation statistics. Oh, we're not, we're not privatising the NHS. 
And this idea about Costa Coffee being so normalized as a franchise in a hospital, if you look back to the 1988 documents that were written by a guy called Oliver Latwin, who you might like because of his amendments on the um, withdrawal agreement bill. No, I am a, a big critic of Oliver Latwin because uh, this is going back some time now. He was an advisor to Margaret Thatcher. That's exactly. Uh, during the time of the Broadwater Farm riots. And mm. uh, he said that there was no point in trying to fund these disadvantaged, harassed, uh, oppressed communities and inner cities because they would spend it all on disco dancing and drug dealing. Oliver let win, bastard. <laughs> well, he also advised Margaret Thatcher on how to privatise the NHS by stealth. And part of that plan talked directly about bringing in these businesses like Costa and hairdressers and how this was quite a good way of, you know, slowly bringing in the private market mm. into hospitals. So it's funny now in 2019, Dominic Raab saying, you know, oh, well, you know, it would be Costa. Well, yeah, that was literally part of your plan that you're currently enacting to privatise the NHS. And if you look at that document and the things that they have introduced, that legislation that forces marketization, which is ineffective for patient care, is exactly what they wrote about in 1988. So, oh, lefty conspiracy that the NHS, they want to privatise it. Yes, because you've written that you want to privatise it and not just you, multiple people in your party because it disagrees with your fundamental principles that, oh, the NHS is actually a communist organisation. Quote from the South Cam's Labour, not Labour candidate, Conservative Ooh, candidate. <laughs> uh, bastard Dominic Raab, defenders of him would say, look, we're still going to have an NHS that's free at the point of delivery. We might have profit-making hospitals who are leeching off taxpayer money, but ultimately, it's not going to be like America. It's not going to be like America. That's what even people like Kate Andrews from the Institute of Economic Affairs, who's, you know, is, is constantly on the TV to say that we need radical reform of the NHS, said, oh, no, but we're going to privatise it, but it won't be like the USA. Well, someone said that we shouldn't have an NHS free at the point of delivery. This emerged today. Who is this who someone? Who could this someone be? Who Surely it couldn't it be, be anyone who's currently hmm. got a position of considerable influence in the Conservative Party. And presumably it would be completely implausible for it to be the person who's running to be the Prime Minister, or who currently is the Prime Minister, to be fair to him. Uh, he did Bra get Brandish the documents. Brandish, we're Easter. brandishing the documents which you can read on Business Insider and, and, and we'll, potentially, we'll potentially get up on the screen now. Uh, so we're going to quote from Boris Johnson now. If NHS service, this is him in 1995, if NHS services continue to be free in this way, they will continue to be abused like any free service. If people have to pay for them, they will value them more. He added that those who say the future the NHS, the future the NHS should be for those who are genuinely sick and for the elderly a bang on the nail. So he's saying that too many people are using the NHS who aren't really sick. And if we paid for it, we'd really value it because there are many people getting their appendixes removed just, just for, the for kicks, fun. Just for they kicks. just they just come in if for fun. If you had to pay for those, you'd you'd damage them less often. I mean, listen, I can't go a week without getting my stomach pumped <laughs> just for kicks. I'm like, I know I don't need it, but just hit me with the good stuff. Um, I mean, what we see is that particularly with free market <laughs> ideologues, Boris Johnson being one, Pretty Patel, Dominic Rob being others, is that when they are not in positions of immense power and they're able to talk openly about their beliefs, they do it in quite uncompromising terms. So Boris Johnson in 1995 is a staunch advocate of payment at the point of use for healthcare services. You go back and you read Dominic Raab and Priti Patel's earlier pamphlets, one of which <coughs> being Britannia Unchained, one of the things that they say is British workers are amongst the worst idlers of the world. They're too concerned with football and pop music. And it's like, yeah, football and pop music, fucking great. Um, <laughs> that's why. Um, and so at those times in which they are trying to um, cement their position within the quite reactionary grassroots of the Conservative Party and also on a very basic level just saying what they think, um, you can see plainly what their intentions are. But the minute they enter positions of prominence and power they know that it would be a complete, it would go down like a cup of sick with the electorate if you go, you know what, your nana with a broken hip shouldn't be so fucking lazy, get her to pay for getting it replaced. Of course, it would be an assault on one of our most treasured institutions in this society. So what you've got to do is slowly achieve a culture change with how we think about 
public institutions. So this goes back to the Thatcherite project, which is the association of the public sector with waste, with bureaucratic inertia and with inefficiency all around. So even defenders of the NHS and people who are in favor of more funding will go, oh, the NHS isn't perfect. Oh, the NHS isn't perfect. Well, it is so much better than the alternative. When you go to the United States and you even simply look at their treatment of the homeless, we do not treat the homeless particularly well in this society, but there is absolutely no comparison between what you see in London and what you see in the States. In the States, you see the compounding of mental health issues with physical health issues, with structural vulnerability because of the lack of social care. You see homeless people with missing fingers and toes from years spent sleeping rough. And those are things which just now we are not seeing as commonly in the UK, and it's simply because the NHS is still something of a social safety net. And so we need to think about how, I think, we strengthen our cultural resilience, our imaginative resilience to these so, uh, sorts of assault on the public sector. Because Boris Johnson's words in 1995 are the honest ones. Anything he's saying now, those are lies. But you talk about this assault on public services. And if you look at any of the performance indicators from the NHS, you can see that they've actually got worse over the last nine years. I think it would be a very skeptical position or cynical position to say maybe they've done this on purpose. But then when you look at people like Kate Andrews from the Institute of Economic Affairs using NHS failure as a reason for legitimizing moving to a insurance-based system, you do start to wonder, why is a government allowed to put through reforms? Because they have put through reforms, even though they say that, you know, oh, we must change it. No, 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 they did change it in 2012. And those reforms have not made the service better. Any of the outcomes would tell you it's making it worse. Well, why are they doing this? Why are they refusing to listen to doctors saying, please scrap the pensions cap because it's stopping us from working even though we want to? Why are they not listening to nurses who say, don't scrap the bursary, we'll have less nurses, and then say, oh, we're going to bring back the nurses' bursary, please elect us. Not the actual nurses' bursary, though, just £5,000 grant because we wouldn't want to actually bring it back because that would be against, you know, our small state ideology. Um, bars. Bars, yeah. Uh, that's the old Chomsky adage, isn't it? Which is that you sort of you run down a public service as an excuse to then privatise it. Exactly. You say, oh, it's in complete crisis. We're going to have to have such radical reform that we get rid of the goddamn thing. Um, and, we're gonna you, and you look at where that has happened, uh, particularly uh, Colchester and Northampton, where huge amounts of uh, local authority provision has been outsourced to companies like Capita. And it has been, honestly, an unmitigated disaster, particularly in Northampton, which is one of the worst performing councils in the country. It's been uh, an experiment in r the ruthless, pulverizing privatization agenda, and it's now on the verge of collapse. Um, and you've also got Colchester, where uh, lots of aspects of children's uh, social care, child protection, was outsourced to a company called Capita, and it was both more expensive and less effective when it came to looking after children. We're going to park the NHS for the moment, as I suppose the Tories would like to do. And we're going to talk about another triangle of bastards. I, I, I want, I've got, it's a quiz for the, for the audience. You've got to guess who we're going to talk about next. They're probably worse than Boris Johnson and Dominic Raab, I'm going to say. Um, one of them we've talked about already. One of them is, was born into money and power, and one of them is dead. Can you guess who our next triangle of bastards is? One we've talked about already. One who's dead, <coughs> one born into money and power. Okay, we can't mm. wait for them to guess it. There might actually be a <laughs> delay. In any case, we're going to talk about Prince Andrew, Donald Trump and Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, this is because Donald Trump not only came over to our great nation last <laughs> night, and, and we think told some porkies about his desire to get his little hands on the NHS. I mean, it's not just we think. It's, 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 it's a fact that he, he said, I've never considered the NHS, where it, we, he's on camera about two months ago saying the NHS will be on the table. So that's, it's not our opinion. That's written, in fact, uh, that that was a lie. The other lie he told was about 
his relationship to Prince Andrew. Everyone, everyone was getting re-smog. I don't, I'm not even sure if anyone Someone got it right. Someone suggested FDR Churchill Stalin, and I was going to be like, when did we mention? <laughs> <laughs> Someone did get Epstein. Anyway, tell us uh, about what Donald Trump had to say about Prince Andrew today and, and why you think it's bullshit. So this is why I think that Donald Trump was briefed on certain topics to deny all knowledge of. Uh, one being the NHS and the other, of course, being Prince Andrew. Just last night, BBC Panorama aired a documentary uh, into the allegations regarding Prince Andrew and Virginia Giuffrey. I think her original surname was Roberts. Yeah. Um, who was a girl who was trafficked by Epstein, horrendously abused by him, and alleges that Prince Andrew did the same in the early 2000s. Uh, when asked about Prince Andrew, Donald Trump claimed that he doesn't know him. Now, this is a difficult one to unpick because who knows if this is true or not? Because Donald Trump now insists doesn't know Prince Andrew. Unfortunately, the Donald Trump of just a few months ago was boasting to the son that he'd played a few rounds of golf with Prince Andrew and had beaten him. And the Donald Trump of a few months ago also attended various social occasions while visiting the UK at which Prince Andrew was in attendance. And unfortunately for the Donald Trump of the present day, the Donald Trump of the past had a picture taken with Prince Andrew in which you can see Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein in the background. Can we flash that up? There we go. We have got Donald Trump. We've got Prince Andrew. We've got Ghislaine Maxwell poking her head in from the side and Jeffrey Epstein. So many receipts on tonight's show. Like the ghost of pedos past (laughs) just looming in there. So again, this is something which was either a genuine omission of memory or an outright lie. And I think this is really important. And the reason, the reason why I think it's important is because we often think of child sexual abuse and sexual abuse more generally as something that happens and is perpetrated by men who leap out from the bushes. They wear, you know, long coats and you can tell who they are. That's not the case at all. Um, the more powerful and unaccountable men are the more able they are to perpetrate forms of sexual abuse and what you saw around Jeffrey Epstein was a code of silence in which everyone knew what was going on and no one spoke up in defense of these girls until one of the parents sounded the alarm Uh, watching the panorama documentary last night I was really struck by Uh, one of the interviewees was a handyman who lived or who worked on the same road as uh, Jeffrey Epstein's, uh, I think, Palm Beach residence and said, yeah, we saw girls going in and out all the time. We knew exactly what was going on. So then when you hear Prince Andrew in an interview that Emily Maitlis saying, well, I was actually a patron of the NSPCC and I was part of their full stop campaign. So, of course, I knew what to look for, for child abuse. And I didn't see any signs of it there is, I think, part of that code of silence again. Well, he also said in that interview, which was a shocking hour of TV, the interview with Emily Maitlis, which was said a couple of weeks ago, he said, well, I mean, with all, with all due respect, I'm used to living in, in houses with lots of people working and with lots of staff, and I just must have assumed that all these young <laughs> 17-year-old women who were giving everyone massages were just staff, which was sort of like his gross fucking comment. Um, I mean, so all I, I suppose that what that panorama doc showed last night is that that was the reason he gave that disastrous interview to Emily Maitlis, wasn't it? Because he was trying to get his version of events out before the version of events of um, the, his his alleged victim came to light. Which I suppose I mean, she gave is not she gave surprising. incredibly compelling testimony. Um, one of the other things that emerged is that there was an email, I think, between Prince Andrew and Ghislaine Maxwell in which he asked after Virginia Roberts by name. Uh, so his key claim that he has no memory of meeting Virginia and perhaps that photograph of the two of them together was a fake is undermined by this email. I didn't clock that bit about the email, but in any case, 
I will double check. I'll take your word I will for double it. check. Because if I'm wrong, I would like to be able to correct it. But... Well, I, I like the fact I that am. you value truth. <laughs> I do. It's clearly a post-truth era. I mean, you have these powerful people and there is clearly just no accountability for their actions. And I think that's the main yeah. thing that we Prince should... Prince Andrew sent an email at 5.50 a.m. inquiring about Virginia Roberts to Ghislaine Maxwell. Sorry, you're 100% right. I'm 100% wrong. Uh, I thought we were going to commit libel. I was worried about it. Um, yeah, we I can't are... afford to get sued by Prince Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have royal litigation money. I don't yeah. have money. We're going to go on to our last topic of the evening before we go to questions, uh, which is uh, a, a very sad one. Uh, last Friday, Jack Merritt, uh, 25, and Saskia Jones, 23, were stabbed to death by Usman Khan, who had been convicted of terrorism in 2012. Uh, they were at a prisoner rehabilitation event when the attacks took place. Now, a terrorist attack in the middle of a general election is always going to be politicised, but Boris Johnson took this to a pretty shameless level. The Prime Minister first used the attack as an excuse to get on the Andrew Marr show. He had previously been denied a place on the Marr couch for his refusal to sit down with the BBC's tougher interrogator, Andrew Neil. He then, so he went on there, the justification from the BBC is that there's been a terrorist attack that people need to hear from their Prime Minister. Then within 20 seconds, he, of course... Uh, was using it as an as a election stump speech and blaming the Labour Party for the attack. Uh, we're going to watch a clip of that now before, I suppose, talking about all the issues that, that, I mean, this tragic event and then Boris Johnson's response brings up. So this How could he be out so early? The answer is, I'm afraid, that he uh, was out because he was on automatic early release. When the judges reviewed his sentence, in 2012, they had yeah. no option but to comply with the law that Labour brought in in 2008, which meant effectively... You say Labour, you've been in power for a Effectively, that he was out, he was yeah. out, they, they had to comply with the law as it stood, and he was uh, out in eight okay. years. And this was a guy, don't forget, you, you that Judge okay, Wilkie let's... said was a very serious jihadi. And that's why, that's why when I, I've, be, I've been yeah. in office for 120 days. Your party's and, been in power for 10 and years. that's why when I stood on the steps of Downing Street, I said we were mm. putting more money into policing. But, but I also said okay. in August that we would no longer allow the automatic early release of, of serious and violent offenders. Hmm. I know you've written about this today, Ash. I suppose at first, maybe, could we talk a bit about, you know, the, the legal issue? What, what did go on? I mean, I find it personally confusing because it was, you know, it's often in the Tories manifesto that people wouldn't now by standard serve half of their terms. And I have always found it a bit confusing that people serve as standard serve half their terms. I don't know why they don't just make the term or the sentence half as long. Because what you had was a gap in the legal system. So you had indeterminate sentences. I know that you're very clued up on this, so correct me if in any place I'm wrong. You had indeterminate sentences introduced by Labour. Uh, but that creates a problem because you can't have indeterminate sentences by the time someone's case is up for their sentence is up for review because they've served a particular stretch uh you can't just say well indefinitely you have to stay here particularly when there's no parole board oversight so you had automatic release at the point of parole review or what would have been parole review is this true i think so so what i understand is that they removed the parole board and this meant that it was automatic as opposed to reviewed so there was no process in place for looking at that before they were let out so it is the case that there was a new Labour change to uh, the imprisonment of not just terror suspects, but all sorts of violent offenders. And there was this gap in the legal system that was created. But you also had a coalition government which could have closed those gaps in the legal system between 2008 and 2012, which would have probably prevented Usman Khan's release in 2012. And let's talk about, I suppose, the politics of it more generally. Obviously, Boris Johnson has used this as an excuse to pitch himself as the person who will be tougher on, on crimes and, and, and tougher on punishment and you know, less, less inclined to let people out uh, early and more inclined to locking people up and throwing away the key. Obviously, this has caused some controversy because this goes against everything one of the victims believed in, um, Jack Merritt and his, I know you've, we're going to go to you in a moment, Ash, I just first of all want to read out a quote from his father, so sort of his father in disgust 
at how this had all been treated by Boris Johnson, wrote a, a short, very powerful article in The Guardian. So we're going to get a quote from that. Uh, so his father writes, if Jack could comment on his death and the tragic incident on Friday 29th of November, he would be livid. We would see him ticking it over in his mind before a word was uttered between us. Jack would understand the political timing with visceral clarity. He would be seething at his death and his life being used to perpetuate an agenda of hate that he gave his everything fighting against. We should never forget that. What Jack would want from want from this is for all of us to walk through the door he has booted down in his black Doc Martens. That door opened up a world where we do not lock up and throw away the key, where we do not give indeterminate sentences or convict people on joint enterprise, where we do not slash prison budgets and where we focus on rehabilitation, not revenge, where we do not consistently undermine our public services, the lifeline of our nation. Jack believed in the inherent goodness of humanity and felt a deep social responsibility to protect that. Through us all, Jack marches on. Borrow his intelligence, share his drive, feel his passion, burn with his anger and extinguish hatred with his kindness. Never give up his fight to Jack Merritt now and forever. I mean, so I wrote an article about this which was published today because I was really struck by the fact that Dave Merritt's specific condemnations of both the right-wing press and Boris Johnson for using the memory of his son to advance a reactionary criminal justice agenda was understood by lots of journalists and repeated by lots of journalists as a generalized plea not to politicize the tragedy. And so we've got to think about what the word politicize means here, because obviously there are grubby forms of electioneering uh, mostly, uh, you know, embodied in Boris Johnson's horrendous interview on The Mar Show. And there are reductive, insulting, cynical ways of viewing this tragedy, which I thought were particularly demonstrated by The Times doing sort of polling projections uh, you know, imagining the impact that the terror attack would have uh, on the election, which I just sort of thought, you know, you're, you're taking these two young lives, two very dedicated, intelligent, compassionate people, and you're understanding it through the lens of what does this mean for 3% marginals? You know what I mean? There was something about that that felt insulting and tawdry and tasteless but then there is the flip side of saying don't politicize this and often that means don't try and understand what has happened by placing it within a political context now all acts of terrorism by definition are political acts there are justifications there are reasoning there are ways in which the act itself is intended to be understood and reacted to by the political structure of the day. And there are political circumstances which make acts of terrorist violence more or less likely. And in this case, in particular with Usman Khan, I think we have to look quite carefully at the treatment of our justice system over a decade of Tory rule. So the Ministry of Justice has endured the deepest cuts of any Whitehall department. It has had 27% of its budget cut. The probation service has had 22% of its budget cut. And of course, Chris Grayling em embarked on that kamikaze program of part privatization in which Sodexo, uh, tried to sack 700 probation officers to replace them with electronic kiosks for ex-inmates to go and check in and out of. Do you think that people are made safer through interaction with trained staff members 
or a glorified ATM machine. You know, you tell me this. You also have cuts to the prison's budget, which has meant that you have these dangerous rates of overcrowding. You have spiraling rates of inmate suicide and also of inmate assaults, both on staff and on each other. And these conditions in prisons have meant that in prison rehabilitation programs of the kind that Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones dedicated their lives to are more difficult to access. So these are all of the things that you lose when you turn it into a litigation of the sentencing regime. Because I think there's something deeply wrong with a political culture which only cares about prisons when it's time to be tough on crime and which only talks about prisons in terms of how long is an inmate's stay there rather than what's going on inside the prison. Because let's say for the sake of argument that Usman Khan served the full 16 years of his sentence. It would have meant that, so he was released in what, 2012, was it? He was convicted in 2012. Convicted in 2012. Um, so it would have meant... No, because that, that, that doesn't make sense to his release. I think he was convicted in 2008. No. No, he was, he was sentenced <clears throat> in 2012. 2012. Okay, all right. I've got that wrong. But had he f- served the full stretch of his sentence, that would have just kept him in prison for longer and the same risks would have applied when he came out. And the other thing that I would like to say is that we are rightly critical of lots of elements of government de-radicalization programs, particularly uh, when they involve mass blanket surveillance of racialized populations like the PREVENT program. But Boris Johnson was personally warned by a former chief prosecutor that you have these inmates who had been convicted under terror legislation, who have not been de-radicalized and who are just booted out into the community into the community without adequate support or monitoring. He was personally warned about this in 2016. And his answer was, well, there you go, going on about money again. So I completely reject this idea that you cannot understand this act within its proper political context because there is a context to it. And it is one in which public safety has been systematically cut back on because the things that you have to fund are complex they're not popular they're not immediately easy to understand and then it means when something bad happens you can bolt that stable door shut long after the horse is bolted and just keep people in increasingly miserable prison conditions but that's not going to turn back the clock on what's happened just to clarify in terms of dates, he was arrested in 20, 2010 and sentenced in 2010. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I think of all that I've learned about Jack Merritt's life over the last few days, and I didn't know him, but he was a friend of some of my friends, is the fact that he stood up for the underdog and he stood against this kind of rising agenda of populism that allows us to look at groups of people with hatred. This is a young man who wrote his MPhil thesis on the overrepresentation of black men in prison and yet the same media that perpetuates these horrific damaging stereotypes are then using this kind of tragedy to say throw away the key and that's exactly what he didn't stand for he was principled in that he'd stand up for the underdog but he was also practiced in it he was clearly a young man who understood what he was doing and why he was doing it and for people to then ignore any evidence base and boris johnson to come on the news and talk about increasing stop and search and other regressive draconian measures is just so disrespectful that it really makes you realize that there's no moral compass to these politicians or to the journalists who choose to publish such hateful articles because if they can't listen to the father of a child who has been murdered by a terrorist asking them not to do that when will their moral compass ever work Mm. and you have you have friends of friends who knew him because he was a he did a master's at cambridge anyway you're studying yeah i didn't i didn't know him at all but i'm conscious that i don't want to do his memory disservice Mm. because obviously there are a lot of his friends who are hurting right now and family. Let's go to some of your questions um, about anything we've talked about tonight or about anything that's going on in the world of politics. As you are typing those, uh, first of all, I'm going to plug the election sesh. So on Thursday, as the polls close, I imagine we'll go live about nine. 
and we'll keep being live until about 4 a.m. How many hours is that? Seven. So that's seven hours of live Navarra Media. Between now and then, we will be live every night or every weeknight at eight, apart from on Friday when we will be going live at half nine because it will be post-debate analysis. I've already got Paul Mason booked in for that, so that will be absolutely unmissable. Um, as ever, you're watching Tisky Sour, you're watching Navarra Media. This show is only possible because of your kind donations. If you are already a subscriber, thank you very much. You make this possible. If not, please go to support.navarramedia.com and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. As the election gets closer, we want more people to see these videos. Uh, so like them on Twitter, like them on Facebook, and keep your comments coming. Share them to your Tory parents. Exactly. Um, right, let's go to some of your questions. Sam D asks... If Labour form a government, how can they undo the privatisation of the NHS that has already occurred? Are there not problems with contracts and whatnot? So, yes, there are problems with contracts mm -hmm. and whatnot. But in the Labour manifesto, they say that they want to repeal the act that I was talking about earlier. So the 2012 Health and Social Care Act. And I have to state that this is also in line with the BMA who say they'd like Section 75 of it repealed. So basically, Section 75 is the bit of it that says you have to put out those contracts to private tender. Um, but re by revoking that whole act, you do make some medics quite nervous because the way that the reforms were brought in in 2012 were drastically fast they were like poorly thought out and most doctors kind of have a reaction of no no we don't want radical reform right now because we've literally just been through that seven years ago but yeah labor do have that in their manifesto and that's not something they talk about enough because it's too nuanced for populist politics so there is a commitment to uh, bring to an end all existing PFI contracts. That was something which was announced by Labour in 2017. And if you're interested in some of the legalities of ending the privatisation of public services, whether it's the NHS or whether it's the railways, I really encourage you to go and listen to the interview I did with Shami Chakrabarti just last week. Because the first thing I asked her was that if Labour former government and she's attorney general, how would she advise a socialist government on the legality of renationalizing various bits of public services for under market rate, which brings you into conflict, not just with existing legislation on the domestic level, but also international treaties as well. One of the things that she says is that if you look at the precedent set in other European countries, which are obviously covered by the European Courts of Justice, is that the right to property is not an absolute right. If that was the case, you couldn't have taxation, you couldn't have any changes whatsoever. So you are able to embark on projects of renationalization and exiting uh, asymmetric contracts and there is precedent to be able to have uh, your legislative program upheld in a court of law. So check out that interview. I really like this question. Bobby Ferminos Teeth. Um, interesting name. I wonder if that's his real double barreled surname or if I don't know what Ferminos means. Um, in any case, he's canvassing tomorrow in Hendon, a marginal. Job. Um, what do you think is the greatest threat to the NHS and what are your favourite NHS related Labour policies? So if you look at like the two main problems the NHS face right now, they would be understaffing and underfunding. Both of those are going to get worse if we have a cliff edge, no deal Brexit. So the first and foremost is to prevent that. I think the Tories agenda is a thinly veiled pursuit of what would be a no deal Brexit that would massively affect the NHS that that would affect drug drugs before we'd even talked about the US and also since the um, Brexit vote we've already seen a massive drop in the number of nurses from the EU applying to come and work here the government the, the Conservative Party are basically saying like oh we'll let the nurses come but not their families that's not fair and people won't come they're humans not just workers um so that is like the main threat is the employment and the ability to get those nurses that we do desperately need because when we talk about bed shortages that's not that we don't have a bed it's that we don't have the staff to make that bed a bed that we can use so yeah i think the best policy in terms of like nerdy policy stuff would be getting rid of that privatization but on the doorstep i think you've just got to say like look the nhs can't deal with losing free movement we need people in terms of what I'm most excited about, I think uh, Labour's policy of free personal care for the elderly and looking at ways in which you can expand that would make mm. a huge difference because we have 
greater need for the NHS and funding is not keeping up with it. And the reason why we've got greater need for the NHS is because we have an aging population. Now, that doesn't mean that once granny and granddad get a bit too old, you just sort of leave them on the hillside and you go ta-ta now. It means that actually the system that they've paid into all of their working lives should look after them. And so that means having quicker GP appointments because when an old person starts to get sick they don't have three weeks to wait because that's a guaranteed way of them needing hospital care because infections and things which are you know very easily shaken off by younger people can become quite severe in older people and it means having a level of personal care which is consistent which is enough time for an old person to be properly taken care of to be monitored in terms of those little fluctuations in their health that happens as someone gets older those things are really crucial in minimizing the need for emergency care and hospital interventions where you can so it's also about changing our approach to health care at a societal level one of the things that we do really badly in this country is public health we think of public health as simply being jamie oliver comes into your school and gets rid of the turkey twizzlers it's not it's about having a holistic approach to care which is also one of the things that's been massively cut, but that's such an unending list, but mm. it's hard to list it all. And I think this is one of the really interesting things about like the terror tactics the Tories are using about, you know, if you vote Labour, you will lose your house, which apparently some candidates have been using on the door. Ian Duncan Smith. Yeah, so people actually no, do... No, Labour aren't going to take your house, people, just your job. But people actually do lose their houses over Ian social Duncan care. Ian Duncan Smith, not voters, yeah, yeah. by the way, because that wouldn't be a good idea. So social care, your your job. like as young people, obviously it's not something that we really come across, but it costs over a thousand pounds a week to look after your nan in a care home. That bankrupts people. And the fact that people frame this whole debate about like, oh, you're going to have to pay more tax. Okay, well, say if you do pay more tax, you know, that top 5%, whatever. You're also protected by the state for things that you can't predict. And surely that should be something that we focus on rather than framing this as if, you know, you're gonna be robbed by that extra 10 pound a month if you earn over 80,000 pounds. Well, imagine if you were actually looked after when you needed it most. Ash, Dan Collins is a sixth form student and he sees people who in his economics class who think billionaires aren't a problem. <laughs> How can Dan get them to vote Labour? Uh, okay, well, the first thing that you should ask your classmates is how does someone become a billionaire? Because there are lots of very talented, very hardworking people who don't become billionaires. So the first easiest way to become a billionaire is to inherit a few million and that's your starting point. The other way to become a billionaire is to own and control a monopoly. So the reason why you have tech billionaires is because they are able to control access to something which everyone needs, and that is information. In the case of, uh, you know, um, in, in the case of, you know, Zuckerberg and others, it's because they had first mover advantage. When people are still working out just what social media could do, they moved first and they were able to monopolize that information. But that's also the case with things like steel, with minerals. And then the other way is through exploitation. And so we can see this with Jeff Bezos. So yes, Amazon have a huge share of internet retail verging on a monopoly but also you have a business model which relies on creating the worst possible conditions for your army of workers so that means high levels of monitoring coupled with very very low pay and so that's how you're able to have jeff bezos become a billionaire and the, then what you have to do I think, is you make a connection between the existence of billionaires and the existence of those in poverty. And you make the case for that, I think, by looking at the, uh, uh, the exploitation angle and the monopoly angle. So when people have a monopoly, they're able to artificially restrict access to this thing that people need and keep the price up. And so... When they're controlling access to something like information or something like steel or something like land, these are things that we all need to survive and to prosper. We can't 
do without it. So that's a fundamentally unjust relationship. And then the second aspect with exploitation, it's Jeff Bezos is rich because his workers are kept poor. And they are kept poor because of the wages that he chooses to give them. And so that creates a society in which billionaires are the engines themselves of poverty, not a solution to it. That's what I would say to your sixth form class. I hope they will be convinced. Uh, Julia, this is a question from FB. Have you come across anyone working in the NHS who actually supports the Tories? Well, <clears throat> I've found two so far. I've been searching. So I think like one of the things uh, I like to do is like try and work out what people think politically because it's really interesting, right? And I have done my fair amount of asking and maybe it's because they already know my position that they're unwilling to admit. But yeah, I've got two and I'll tell you about both of them. I probably shouldn't do that, but anyway. One of them <clears throat> is literally a member of the University Conservatives Association. So I was like, oh, he must have some pretty good arguments about why he's made this decision. Nothing. Mm. Absolutely no evidence. <laughs> Nothing. Disappointing. And the second was a guy who told me that he believed in democracy and Brexit means Brexit. So in terms of NHS staff, no, there's not a particularly Tory-leaning stance because obviously they have to live with the reality of a government who chooses to underfund and reorganise a healthcare system in a way that doesn't work. But obviously, you always get a few people who are unwilling to engage in informed debate. Um, oh, Ash, thoughts on Kamala Harris dropping out of the Democratic 2020 race, which I think happened just before we went live. So Kamala Harris is out. She's been polling atrociously. And if you read an NYT piece on the internal dynamics of her campaign, it's no surprise. It seems like an absolute clown car in there. So on the one hand, you've got... Uh, her sister running a huge amount of the campaign and then someone else, both of them are at loggerheads, so there's conflicting information and she decided to bank everything on Iowa and pour campaigning resources into Iowa. The problem is, is that because she was focusing on one little thing and because of the way in which the primaries work, uh, she'd taken her eye off in other states that she would need to at least scrape by in, not looking likely, so... The Iowa strategy is mm. out. But the other thing with Kamala Harris is exactly who is her social base? Because on a very superficial level, yes, of course, she reminds Democrats of that kind of Obama moment of a you know mixed race woman who has worked as part of the criminal justice system. She was a prosecutor um, who could, you know, speak to America's sense of self as an accepting, tolerant, and multiracial society without being frightening or radical. And in the first debate, when Biden was stumbling all over the place trying to justify his earlier support for segregationist policies, she was able to tell her life story in a way which is very, very compelling. But moving on from that, in particular, when you know, Medicare for all is the central policy issue in the Democrat primaries and she doesn't have a tremendous amount to say for, say for that. And when in particular the young uh, Democrat base who are left-leaning and also very diverse are in favour of prison reform and policing reform, for Kamala Harris to have that reputation as being very hawkish and authoritarian uh, from her time in California is that that never really was going to help her and also and this is a little detail from the NYT piece apparently her campaign team were obsessed with what people were saying about her on Twitter Aww. so all of those like ultra leftists being like Kamala is a cop you did this <laughs> enjoy your victory I think Kamala Harris definitely suffered from running in I suppose, a highly politicised time with no politics. So, I mean, you could say about Buttigieg, who's sort of like now taking on the mantle as the centrist candidate. You could say in a way that he's got no politics and he doesn't seem to be connected to any sort of like social base. Although, I mean, he does have a social base with rich people. But, <laughs> but he, he does have a policy, which is to say you can't have a better world. 
you know, you have to be realistic and being realistic means accepting that you will have a privatized healthcare system, et cetera, et cetera. Then you've got Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren who were saying you can have a better world, you can have Medicare for all. And then there was Kamala Harris in the middle sort of saying, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe you can, maybe you can. Maybe can't. I could just arrest your parents. <laughs> yeah. So there was actually, I listened to it, it was a very revealing uh, interview with her on again and this was on the nyt podcast this was a few months ago where they asked her you know like what you know what, what is the sort of political beliefs that guide you and she literally sort of said like oh no, um, none none <laughs> 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 she, she did it she said none she was like you know i kind of i tend to just do what what works and then she told this really like naff story about like car parking as sort of like her example of pragmatism it was sort of like, whoa, I don't think you can be the president if you don't have, if like your answer was just about like car parking. Okay, no, go, case, go on, go what are the, what are the polit- political values and principles which guide you to? Go on. Me? Is, is yours going to be none? Uh, oh. Oh, no, no, fuck off. <laughs> Sorry, I don't normally tell my guests to fuck off, but I thought that was kind of like, I thought that was kind of rude. Uh, oh, so I was. Sorry, <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, the, 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 the political principles that guide me, I would say that, um, well, I mean, as I say, I'm a class, I'm a class world social democrat. Um, I do think that we can have uh, a better society if we have people who, who organize against the establishment and elites. Um, and basically, we can have democratic control over significant parts of the economy so that we can all live the good life. Um, I like it. Thanks for giving me some time to think yeah, as well. You know. Go for yours. Um, Are you going to swear at me first? No. Because that's the, that's the Well, move. you didn't insult her. I can. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> go on, go on. Uh, as a kid, I was always kind of brought up with this idea that, you know, society is reflected by how you care for those who have the least. So I think that when I look at the UK today and I see a situation like you might have seen last night on Channel 4 Dispatches and something that I saw growing up because I went to a really diverse state school where I always recognised that I was quite lucky in that system because I had this house and, you know, a, a stable family. Like, why in the sixth richest economy, can't we all have that? That's kind of my motivating factor in politics. And also, why do we allow people to govern without using ev- any evidence? So I'd say justice, evidence-based politics. <laughs> evidence-based <Ooh>. justice. <laughs> evidence-based, <laughs> evidence-based climate justice. justice. <laughs> Ash, go on. What are your I mean, operations? I would have to say none. It's like when you're parking a car <laughs> and yeah. you see a space that's just open. Um, I think fundamentally, I don't think that misery should be part of any human's fate. And when you see something as arbitrary as money dictating whether or not someone is happy or someone is miserable, you just think, well, this stupid thing should be out of the way. Yeah. And that is why she is literally a communist. Yeah. I mean, there is a thing. Life is already difficult enough. Let's just like make people's lives a bit easier. Don't don't unnecessarily make them homeless and shit. It's Do you think that ultimately is dramatically... Already. This is my, sort of, this is my <laughs> left-wing version of Jordan Peterson. You know, Jordan Peterson's like, life is suffering and you have to accept it entirely. And everyone's like, life is suffering. So let's just make it really nice around the edges with a very well-funded and supportive welfare state. I actually don't think life is suffering because I think once you eliminate poverty and once you get past this myth that economics is about the allocation of scarce resources no at present economics is about the imposition of scarcity on abundant resources then the only thing keeping you miserable is your poor taste in men and that leaves you by the time you hit like 25 26 it's fine um all right let's end it there um that's I think really that was, good advice by the way that was a very nice way to end the show i think talking about what all of our you know guiding principles are um, in any case, thank you so much, Julia Simons. Thanks for um, having me. You were brilliant. You've gone down incredibly well in the comments. Um, <laughs> Ash Sarka, you always go down incredibly well in the com- I'm comments. I'm so sorry for assassinating you on your own damn show. I know, on my own. Nothing. <laughs> I can't believe that. Nothing. Um, <laughs> in any case, uh, thank you so much for watching. Tune in tomorrow at 8 p.m. for another edition of Tisky Sour. We will be live nightly until election night. Well, apart from the weekend. Good night.